So, Miss Fairfield, why are you still here? What do you mean? You sit there glaring at me, contradicting everything I say, having made no apology for your snobbish, sly, too clever by half little review of my book. Which obviously hit the mark. It's a good book. I didn't say it wasn't. He didn't say it was either. He could leave now. Everyone else has. The hour grows later, the fire burns down. But you don't. On the contrary, you keep it stoked. Another log on the fire, another story. We lean closer to the glowing embers. There's a thrill to it, isn't there? Something that quickens the blood. A delicious feeling of dread. Do you deny it? Of course. As I said, it's all merely the manipulation of effects. A literary exercise. Only a critic could talk such nonsense. The way you look down your nose at me, Mr. Wallace, as though I were some sort of rebellious chocolate cream. Wasn't that lovely? Now, where were we? Miss Fairfield was making a point, I believe, about the dangers of the supernatural. The dangers of believing too much in it. I'm sorry, Sissy, you were going to begin your story. It's getting late, perhaps. Perhaps when it comes to it, your case won't really stand up. Very well. Once upon a time, many years ago, there was a baron. A baron who loved to tell stories of his grim ancestors and who was a firm believer in the supernatural. The baron was a small man, but he had a big heart. He had inherited both the family honor and the family feuds, and he was on very poor terms with some of his neighbors because of disputes or ill deeds carried out on one side or the other several generations ago. He also had a very beautiful daughter brought up with great care by two maiden aunts, who, having been outrageous flirts in their younger days, were admirably adapted to function as strict guardians and censors of her conduct. We never let her out of our sight. And she rarely goes out of the castle at all. <laughs> we have continually lectured her about strict decorum and implicit obedience. As for men, we have taught her to hold them in distrust. Unless properly authorised, she will not so much cast a glance on the handsomest. No, not even if he were dying at her feet. Other young ladies might go astray. But nothing of that kind can ever happen to a daughter of the line of Landshort. The story begins on the day of a great feast. The time had come for nothing less than the marriage ceremony of the Baron's fair daughter. She had been betrothed to young Count von Ordenburg son of a distant but distinguished friend of the Baron. The preliminaries had been carried out without the two young people meeting, but now Count von Altenberg was on his way to receive his bride. The fatted calf had been killed, the wine cellar had been ransacked, and the wedding guest was eagerly awaited. The fair bride had been decked out with uncommon care. Doesn't she look a picture? Remember, keep your eyes down, don't stare at him. Yes, Aunt. Poor love, she's all of a quiver. <laughs> <laughs> the Baron paced the battlements, impatiently waiting for the bridegroom. The sinking sun gleamed along the summits of the mountains and cast the surrounding forests into deepening shadow. What's happened to the man? Why is he so late? Meanwhile, the long-awaited bridegroom, the Count von Altenberg, was riding through the forest. At the sober pace in which a man travels towards marriage when all the trouble and uncertainty of courtship have been taken off his hands. He was accompanied by a new friend he had met along the way, Sir Hermann von Stauckenfast. So, Holtenberg, you're to be married to the Baron Landshort's daughter. Indeed. They say she's very beautiful. So they do. You know her then? My father's castle, Castle Stauckenfast, is not far off. But I'm afraid we have nothing to do with the land shorts. Why not? Because of ill deeds carried out several generations ago. Ah, yes, I understand. We have just the same sort of thing in Altenburg. So the two young men rode together, getting on very well, until, in a particularly lonely and wooded defile of the forest, they were attacked by robbers. They defended themselves bravely and beat off their assailants but not before the unfortunate bridegroom had received a mortal wound. Uh, I beg you, my dear Stark and Fast, repair instantly to the castle of Landshort 
and inform the Baron of the fatal cause of my failure to keep the marriage tryst. Yes, but how can I? I must remind you that due to ill deeds carried out between our family and... Please, I have plighted my word. Unless you do, I will not sleep quietly in my grave. Go. I beg you. This left the young Hermann von Starkenfast in something of a quandary. He had no wish to be the bearer of ill tidings to an ancient enemy. On the other hand, he had a deathbed pledge to perform. Sorely perplexed, he arranged for the burial of his unfortunate companion in the nearest monastery at Wurzburg. Meanwhile, in the castle Landshort, the Baron was in despair. What can have happened to him? The feast is overcooked, the guests are famished. Why isn't he here? But just then, a solitary stranger crossed the drawbridge. He was a tall, pale cavalier, mounted on a dark horse. I am so sorry to break in upon you in this way. But never mind that, you're here now, thank God. The cook was on the point of committing suicide, and we're all starving to death, but come in, come in. <laughs> now then, let's get the formalities over with. Here's the young lady. Forgive me, sir, but... Oh. This is my daughter. Hope she's up to scratch, eh? Hey. Yes, sir. Catsy to the bridegroom. Say something, my love. Welcome. Thank you. Fine! Let's eat! The banquet was all the more enjoyed for the delay. The feasting and merriment were unbounded, but the tall, dark cavalier scarcely tasted his food. He was wholly absorbed in his bride-to-be. May I fill your glass? You may. And now may I drink to you. Fairest creature I have ever seen. Oh. Oh, look at her blush. Look at her sigh. Love at first sight. <laughs> but as the feast continued, the young man began to wear an air of dejection. What is it? What's the matter? I cannot tell you. He looked more and more melancholy, and his unaccountable gloom began to cast a chill over the whole company. Or so the story goes, the goblin horseman catches up the lovely creature and gallops away with her into the night and she was never seen again from that day to this. What do you think of that, eh? What's the matter? Sir, midnight approaches and I must leave. What? But we have a chamber prepared. I must lay my head in a different chamber tonight. Come, come, you can't be serious. Sir, I have a solemn and indispensable arrangement. Couldn't someone else go? I must attend in person. I must return to the monastery of Wurzburg. But leave it till tomorrow morning, eh? Then you can take your bride. My engagement is with no bride. It is with the worms. <laughs> the worms. I am a dead man. I have been slain. My body lies at Würzburg. My grave awaits. And tonight, I am to be buried. I must away! Bloody hell. The dismay of the company may be imagined, especially as letters arrive the next day confirming the news of the young Count's murder and his interment at Würzburg. But what of the young lady? She lay that night in her boudoir, which she shared with her ever-vigilant aunts, pensively gazing at the light of the full moon that fell across her chamber floor. Suddenly, she felt impelled to rise from her couch and go to the window. There's someone there, in the shadow of the trees. A man is lifting his face to the moonlight. <gasps> Heaven and earth! It is he! It is my bridegroom! <laughs> Well, I'm not moving, and I forbid you to say anything of what has just occurred. If my lover wishes to keep watch over my chamber, alive or dead, you are not to stop him. Or perhaps he will come to visit you. For the poor young lady, there was something consoling in the spectre of her lover. His manly beauty was still visible night after night in the moonlight. 
And though the shadow of a man is not best calculated to satisfy the affections of a lovesick girl, it seemed to her to be better than nothing. She had no difficulty in persuading her aunts to sleep in another chamber, and made them promise to say nothing of the matter. This they succeeded in doing, despite all expectations to the contrary, for several days. Until one morning at breakfast, a terrible discovery was made. Where is my daughter? Her room is empty. Her bed has not been slept in. Her window is open. She has flown. What is the meaning of this? Oh, so it was him. That dreadful shape. What? Your poor daughter. Wrapped away to the grave by the spectre bridegroom. <laughs> God in heaven! My poor daughter. The horse. Scour the forest. Call for a priest. Bring me my sword. But just as the Baron was saddling his horse, a lady was seen approaching the castle, accompanied by a tall, dark chevalier. Father. My daughter. Where have you been? And who is this man? Ah, the spectre. Sir. You are no ghost. No, sir. I am Sir Hermann von Starkenfast. What? A Starkenfast? Explain yourself. Sir, I was charged by the dying bridegroom to bring you news of his death. But when I arrived, I was tongue-tied, first by the difficulty of my task, and then by the beauty of your daughter. I was captivated, sir, and could think of no way to extricate myself, except by the harmless deception which I hope will be forgiven. Go on. Fearing the ancient hostility of your family, but besotted by your daughter, I haunted the garden beneath her chamber window until I wooed and won her. She consented to be my bride, and I have to tell you, sir, we were married this morning. What? Married? To a Stark and Faust? A man practiced in deception? All's fair in love and war, sir. Oh. I suppose. Better a live Stark and Faust than a dead... whatever. I give you my blessing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, father. <laughs> so the revels were resumed. The aunts were scandalized. If only we had put bars on the window, this would never have happened. I thought it was a ghost, a real ghost. But the niece seemed perfectly happy to have found that her spectre bridegroom was in fact substantial flesh and blood. It was not the Baron's readiness to believe in the supernatural that was at fault. He was practiced on. Should he not have seen through the deception? As you would. I like to think so. How I wish I could put you in such a situation. I don't think you would find it so easy. Try me. Well, perhaps I shall. I believe that in your heart of hearts, you would find it impossible to discount the supernatural entirely. We all of us know that there are more things in heaven and earth. And instinctively, we understand that we disregard these things at our peril. I could tell you a story, if you would set aside your critical detachment for just a moment. Ooh, why should I do that? Because this is a story for which I have what I consider to be very convincing evidence. Violet? Oh, yes. Yeah. You carry on. Don't mind me. 